Okay, so I feel that the room is uh, fairly full, so I'm really glad to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Christophe Fontaine, and I shouldn't be there, actually, because um, I'm here because um, Abiran, Sporty, and Veda were not able to uh, attend this conference, so they asked me to uh, present uh, that topic uh, here, but I'm happy to be there and to see uh, all those uh, familiar faces. So what we will be talking about is BGP today. How do we enable multi-cluster connectivity in an efficient manner? But what are we talking about? Because are we talking about deployments? Uh, does it work? And on the efficiency, we'll uh, see the different uh, uh, performance metrics. So it will be a very small performance metric, but uh, keep it up with me. And I will try to make it quick, so we'll have plenty of time uh, for Q&A. So, about spine and leaf deployment challenge, you already know that. There is nothing new. The spine and leaf deployments are some, somehow common now. Um, we do have some challenges on the controller side because uh, we have to replace all the layer two mechanism with a layer three capable mechanism to uh, deploy the controller nodes on three different sites. And on the compute side, well, some, somewhat, somehow that's easy to do as well. The actual challenge is about the top of rack configuration. How do we uh, integrate all of that? We could go with Ansible networking, so that's great, but some, sometimes it's not enough. Where the fun begins is about the multi-cluster story. How do we integrate that? When we have one tenant, one customer, which deploys a set of virtual machines across multiple uh, data centers, um, across multiple uh, regions, how do we interconnect that? But basically, isn't that issue already solved? Because with Neutron ML2, we can bring third-party SDN vendors, and that's featureful. We already have a solution to interconnect multiple clusters with BGP, and honestly, it just works. You also have, thanks to those third-party SDN vendors, uh, the ability to configure the physical switches in addition to the virtual switch. But sometimes the cost means that we have to do something upstream. And what can we do? The solution is called Oven BGP Agents. We do have two drivers, one for each use case, basically. The first one for BGP uh, as a simple BGP speaker, and the other one, so and that's what we will mainly focus today on, is the eVPN driver. So how do we enable multi-cluster connectivity through BGP? And I will not go over and over that presentation because um, some colleagues already did that last year in Berlin. They already presented the world architecture and how they integrated that into OpenStack. And unfortunately, they weren't there <laughs> today, but. Um, on the eVPN, compared to the BGP driver, uh, the eVPN also brings the compatibility with the actual OpenStack API, so that on the tenant side, you do have the ability to integrate and to interconnect multiple tenants. And the workflow is fairly simple, because you have an OpenStack CLI, OpenStack uh, API in order to uh, configure the proper database, and the database will be um, updated within Neutron, and you have all the hooks within the eVPN driver. And voila, you do have those intercon interconnection. So, honestly, if it works, don't fix it. But, honestly, does it work for everyone? Because if we look at that schema specifically, what do we have? We have the data pass, so directly from the virtual machine to the um, integration bridge on one node. Your packet is still ported directly to the networker node. Then again, within the integration bridge, and then you have, what do we have? The kernel routing. What if on those nodes, on those obvious bridges, we have obvious DBDK, and we'll go very simple with obvious DBDK. We still have the kernel routing. So this means that we have to punch all the packets from the user space down to the kernel space. And 
this action will actually slow down the complete data bus, unfortunately. So is that efficient enough? We're saying that the kernel is actually slowing down the whole data bus. Don't get me wrong, the kernel stack is awesome. It has a lot of features on the, term, on the ability to terminate the TCP connection. It's doing a marvelous job, really. So we could say that it's really fantastic for 99% of the IT workloads. But sometimes we just want to push the uh, cursor a bit further and to go one way, uh, one step above. How do we remove that bottleneck for VMs which are exposed through BGP when they use OVSDK, SRUV, OVS overflow, those acceleration technologies? So what do we need? So we do have a DBDK app within a virtual machine with all the tunings that we have. So huge pages, CPU uh, dedicated uh, cores, and so on and so forth. We do have oven with OVS DBDK, once again with huge pages and dedicated cores. And then we have a kernel router. So the answer is simple. We need a DBDK-based virtual router. But how can we do that? If it was as simple as that, <laughs> we would already have done that. And we have multiple options. And OVS stands for Open Virtual Switch. So that's a layer three, and that's not a virtual router as is. It still has some routing capability, because when you have a Geneve tunnel, what do you do? You are actually injecting that packet into that tunnel. And if you will look at the open flow rules, well, the packet is directly routed by OVS. So how does it do that? Basically, OVS already has some routing capabilities specifically for tunnels. That um, route is already configured thanks to Netlink uh, because it listens to the uh, routing table. So we have a copy of the kernel routing table directly within Open vSwitch. And that's great because it works for ages with OVS ML2 before and uh, uh, OVN ML2 today. So with OVS with uh, VXLAN tunnels and um, OVS with Geneve tunnels today. But it was meant in definitely only for tunnels and for tunneling. So does it support VRF? Does it support um, IPv4 and IPv6 uh, stacks in order to answer to ICMP message or neighbor discovery messages? As of today, no. So this is really only a layer three switch. So this means that we would have to implement all those different features to make it and to transform it as a router. And because it's a switch and not a router, we also have additional issues. So what if you have an MTU mismatch? You cannot fragment the packet. OK, it's not an, anymore an issue with IPv6, but we still have a lot of IPv4 workloads today. So this means that even on the upstream community, this would be extremely difficult to integrate. Not impossible, but uh, to transform a switch into a router, that would require a lot of effort. And we need that feature now. So what can we do different? We already have a router within the logical router in the oven, so why can't we use it? But because basically, we need to inject the proper routing flow directly, open this switch, and oven is meant for that. So let's try to reuse it. I talk about ARP messages and ICMP v6. It's already handled because we do have that oven controller running locally, so all those packets, and, um, can be directly injected to an oven controller, and it will do its magic to either generate or answer those ARP and uh, neighbor discovery messages. So on that front, we're covered. But basically, in order to have that local open flow rule, what do we need to have? We need to have that route declared into oven northbound database, directly within the uh, logical router. But how do we access to that northbound database? Through the Neutron API. That means that for every chassis gateway node, for every networker node, we would need to have a kind of a feedback loop directly from Open BGP agents, so directly FR, which would inject the routes into the Neutron API. And then uh, Neutron API would do its magic to forward the API and uh, call uh, the uh, proper 
all the NAML2 plugin, so that will have the root in the northbound database, that would be transformed into the proper logical flow in the southbound database, and finally transformed with Oven controller uh, as a, an open flow rule within that uh, integration bridge. But that's somehow difficult, because with one node, that's great, but what if you have 1,000 nodes? Because with the BGP uh, driver in uh, Oven BGP agent, you have one FR instance running on, and so one Oven BGP uh, container running on all compute nodes. This is why it's going to be difficult to do that, because we cannot scale it. Let's put it that. So the third and final option was, OK, we do have one Oven cluster. What if we bring another one? That other one would be extremely small because it would be running locally on each network node. But the concept would be exactly the same. Uh, Oven BGP agent would just forward the routes locally to the other um, Oven cluster, well, or single node Oven. Uh, and that would push the proper routes directly to another bridge. So that was the approach that was taken by uh, Luis. And yeah, so what are the numbers? Because when we're talking about numbers uh, and performances, we need to think globally. Because on the um, control plane side, it's not a control plane issue anymore. Because we do have an end-to-end DBDK-enabled data pass. So how did we measure that? It was a very simple setup, an all-in-one deployment in that uh, specific case with one provider network so that we have one leg directly connected to a DPK-based application. And on the external network, we do have uh, a floating IP uh, held on the BRBGP. So everything's great. And on the uh, traffic generator side, we decided to use uh, T-Rex, because that's what we use on a daily basis, um, at least in Red Hat, in order to generate and simulate the uh, proper traffic. So on the virtual machine, we actually have open vSwitch, obvious DPDK as well, because uh, we, th we could have bring a third-party uh, DPDK-based uh, router, but we already have that L3 switch, which is uh, obvious DPDK, so let's use it as well. And everything is configured I would say, in a standard NAV configuration. So with huge pages, dedicated CPUs, uh, we do have the proper isolation with uh, Chundi and the CPU partitioning profile, both on the hypervisor and within the guest. And the only thing that we modified is that we either deploy with the second uh, deep, um, oven cluster or without it. So either with the kernel data pass or with the DPDK data pass. The kind of test and traffic that we inject is fairly similar to the RFT 2544. So that's 64 byte frame size. So that's really small, but this is the standard kind of test. On the configuration, we also um, have multiple routes with static routes and so on and so forth, but nothing, honestly, nothing fancy. What does that mean? If it's not fancy, it just means that we are just back to the existing performance number that we have of kernel versus OVS DPDK. Because we have a dual uh, port uh, Intel NIC with 10 gigabit interfaces. And within OVS, uh, within the virtual machine, uh, we do have some specifically crafted open flow rules, really to simulate a, a router. So nothing fancy, as I said. On the kernel routing side, we are at roughly 400,000 uh, uh, packets per second. So it's not low, it's not high. That's basically what we have. And with OVSDBK, uh, we were able to reach uh, a bit more 4 million packets per second. So that's a huge, huge difference. But unfortunately, that's only the best case. Because doing that means that we are not using any kind of NAT or any kind of fancy feature. This is really great for the multi-cluster connectivity when you are just routing the packets from one leg, from one network to another one. What if we want to use um, the initial um, deployment, which is basically with a BGP driver? This means that we do have a floating IP. If we have a floating IP, we have NAT. 
And we, if we have that, it really means that we have contract. And unfortunately, uh, as soon as we enable contract, the performance drops. Roughly, uh, still on the same characteristics, we can go from 4 million packets per second down to 1.2, 1.3 million packets per second. Still, it's much better than what we could have on the uh, kernel space because that's really a zero loss packet uh, test. Also, what can we do? And I talk about OVSTC flower offloads, but what about uh, those smart NICs? We still have two physical interfaces. So on the compute side, nothing changes. We have uh, either OVS DBK or OVS uh, other offloads, and we are able, in a L2 mode, uh, we're able to reach line rates with a Connect X5, Connect X6 NIC with 10 to 25 uh, gig interfaces. Honestly, that's completely flawless. We do have the SRV performances. That's great. As I said, we don't want to have that routing capability to be a bottleneck. So let's try to put exactly the same uh, setup on the uh, network nodes, so with obvious TC flower offloads, so obvious other offload. And that's where it hurts. Why? That's because the physical to physical flow cannot be offloaded. That's an existing limitation on those connect techniques, and we cannot do anything. So on the TC flower story, that's great if you are only using one driver, which is the um, standard BGP driver. So when you have the virtual machine and the external network directly connected on the single node, so the virtual function to the physical function, so the VM to the physical interface, you can offload that flow and you are able to be line rates. As soon as you move to a network node, so physical to physical, just like any other um, appliance, you cannot do that today. Of course, we are trying to improve that, but that's how it is. But the real question is, do we need TC flower offload in that case? Because we have the other option, which is OVS DPDK. And with OVS DPDK, on a physical to physical forwarding, that's where DPDK really shines. And we can be completely in line rates flawlessly. In fact, with only one core, we're able to forward 29 million packets per second. And that's a network node. What does that mean? That means that we have the complete node dedicated for forwarding. So we, no, we don't have two cores. We may have 20 cores to forward that. So with 100 gig interfaces, routing is easy. And thankfully, uh, even if we do have OVS DPDK and the contract, the user space contract issue, uh, the latest improvement in uh, upstream, well, basically means that we can actually be line rate as well, and we can uh, push much, much more data. Which means that we can still deploy OVS TC flower offload for your workloads on the compute node, but for the network nodes, as of today, we could go directly with OVS DPDK in a single deployment. So what can we do better? Um, BGP as an entire uh, protocol, is that really so great? That's an open question, because we have something else which is called OSPF, which was basically meant for that. I see some weird looks, but uh, <laughs> that could be another option as well. And with Open BGP Agent, uh, we are basically using FR. So switching from one mode to another one could be an option. It really depends on you, whether you tell us, OK, that's really interesting to have OSPF as an EGP and uh, to keep BGP for, uh, of course, the uh, multi-cluster connectivity. But maybe that's an option. Uh, we know that some uh, hardware vendors charge much more uh, as soon as you want to enable BGP compared to uh, OSPF, which is enabled and available by default. So is that something that would interest you? That's an open question. As I said, the physical to physical flow of loads, uh, so so-called the hairpinning, so you enter into one interface, you may go out to the same interface. Uh, we are actively working on that. In fact, uh, on the uh, DBK user space for the uh, RT flow of load, uh, we know that the uh, CNX, the connect, yeah, the, the, the CNX uh, driver is actually uh, uh, working on that. So that could be great as well. Also, all those 
um, elements are only BGP speakers who are only announcing either a single IP, so a slash 32, slash 128, or eventually a network. But do you see any use case that you will want to learn routes directly on the compute node? Because today, the upstream router is used as a route reflector. That's great. And that upstream router is uh, also used as default gateway. So we don't need today to learn routes directly on the compute node. Do you think that it's something that could be valuable for you as well? So basically, the open question is, what do you need? And I get my promise that we have 10 minutes, complete 10 minutes for Q&A. So the mic is open. If anyone wants to ask some questions. And if you're too shy to do that, yes. Please. <laughs> Excuse me? Did you use multi protocol BGP during the capacity? No. No. Uh, today, the, um, that's an EVPN uh, type 5 that is used for the um, multi cloud interconnect for the uh, BGP VPN, uh, uh, EVPN VXLAN. Uh, I don't think so, no. And is there any specific use case uh, that you, where you would prefer type 2 instead of type 5? Uh, I mean, it's the potential for passing L2 traffic over a BGP path instead. So uh, if you wanted adjacency between data centers yep. that are L2 separate. OK. Yes? It consumes a scalability, like how many basically like geo, location, geography, what type of, how many, how many stacks we're talking about here? Oh, honestly, it's about the interconnect connectivity, so um, there is no limit in the sense that it's a controlled plane uh, protocol. So uh, if it's about only reaching the uh, other cl uh, cluster, well, there is no limit in that sense. You will, of course, have the uh, latency issue but between two data centers. So, of course, we cannot do anything about that. But on the um, scale size, no, basically no issue. What was tested by, by your team like, in terms of? Well, uh, on, on my team, we really focus on the um, data plane performances and how we can enable that uh, feature for NFV use cases and not on the scalability side as of today. So, you mentioned also about line rate, like 100 gig. Yes. Um, yes, uh, when we said that we are line rate with uh, the RFC 2544, that really means that we want to be able to push as many packets as the wire is capable of. So for a 10 gigabit interface, that's um, roughly uh, 14, yes, 14 million packets per second. Uh, so of course, for 100 gigs, that's 140 uh, million packets per second. Perspective, actually, are you peering with the tor switches or, uh, or in the in that case? If I go back to the uh, general architecture, yeah, uh, we are only um, peering with the leaf switch, which are uh, root reflectors. The leaves are more out, like, so yes. Okay. Yes. Back to the subject of this uh, PTK VTR router. I don't know if I get it uh, properly. You said that this is a separate VN stack uh, running on the network cloud. Uh, uh. So, yes, indeed. In that specific deployment, we will have two oven controllers running on the same network nodes. One dedicated for OpenStack and the other one dedicated, well, one dedicated for OpenStack with the integration bridge, inter BR int, and another one dedicated with another bridge, uh, which is BR BGP. So, indeed, we'll have two independent oven clusters, but that second cluster is really limited to that unique node. So, we will not uh, create any kind of tunnels with the other network nodes. That's really local. So, there will be like some uh, virtual interface between this uh, two. Yes, we do have um, we do have a patch port in it between the BR int and so it's not the actual topology that you will find uh, in the compute node that, that's a virtual one, uh, but well that's a simplified one. Uh, but you will have indeed an intermediate bridge between the two, but everything is connected through patch ports, which means that at the end, even if you have 
multiple bridges interconnected with patch ports, uh, at the end you will have only one open flow or one data pass flow. So whatever the number of bridges that you have, you always end with a unique data pass flow. And that's why we can leverage a single open vSwitch with DPDK. And, and there is an assumption that there is a specific interface to doing this uh, interconnection between the sites, right? And that's a patch port. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. We always have a unique master for each element. So on the OpenStack side, we only have Neutron, which configures Oven Northbound database. And for the second um, Oven agent and second Oven cluster, it's only Oven BGP agent, which is actually pushing routes to the uh, Northbound database as well. Yes. Yes. What's the implication of FR in the Well, um, FR is here and um, in order to uh, peer with the actual router, and we are using and uh, we are configuring FR in order to advertise the different uh, networks or uh, individual IPs. Oh, you're just driving the routes and just yes. Them. Yes, exactly. That's the API, right? Exactly, and um, FR is actually uh, run within the context of the OpenBGP agent container. So that's within that. So it's a separate, um, I don't know if it's a separate container within a single pod. Yes, I think it's uh, that. OK, so if you don't have any other question, anyway, uh, I will be hanging around here. So yes? What's the developments? Uh, I mean, uh, what's the progress and uh, what's the status of the project right now? Um, yes, uh, good question. So, the, as you can see today, the OpenBGP agent code has been pushed from the um, private, well, on GitHub uh, repository directly to the OpenStack Foundation, so that's uh, now under the Neutron umbrella. Uh, and which means that the second um, oven controller, we still have one or two patches that are still hanging around, but uh, they should be merged. If not yet, uh, it will be merged in the uh, upcoming weeks. So everything is, should be available upstream uh, if not already. Yes. So the, the next question and the tricky question is about the installation phase and how do we deploy that? But that's completely outside of uh, oven BGP agent project. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much.